I'm Mr. Eliasson, and welcome to World History. Today we're going to talk about the end of the Middle Ages in Europe. These are our objectives for the day. They'll also be reflected on the daily assignments. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, there were few organizing principles left in Europe. Of course, with the empire gone, Europe collapsed into somewhat of a, into a much more local governmental system, with really the only thing tying Europeans together was the Catholic Church. As you hopefully remember, Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire after the reign of the Emperor Constantine. When the empire split into eastern and western halves under the Emperor Diocletian, the eastern part of the Roman Empire began to uh, develop their, their form of Christianity slightly different, whereas the Western piece continued to look to the Bishop of Rome and became what we know as the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church was organized very similarly to the Roman Empire. You can see there's a clear hierarchy with the Pope, the Bishop of Rome on top, followed by cardinals, archbishops, bishops, and then your local lay priests. The largest buildings that most people would interact with would also be their, lo their local cathedrals or their local churches, and they would often have the most impressive architecture and be the most, the most grand buildings that most people would ever interact with. Roman Catholicism also more or less organized all aspects of European life through the seven Roman Catholic sacraments. So from the very moment that a child was born and baptized to the moment in which the priest performs last rites, all of the important rituals throughout a person's life would be organized by the Catholic Church. As this source clearly shows, the Roman Catholic Church again unified Europeans and brought massive wealth and power to the Catholic Church. The Pope, as we mentioned before, was the Bishop of Rome and the single leader of the Catholic Church. The Pope had a variety of different powers that he used in order to ensure that various uh, kingdoms did what he wanted. One of the most powerful popes in medieval Europe was Innocent III, who uh, rivaled kings as far as his political uh, authority. The symbol of the Pope is the keys of St. Peter, as you can see here up in the top right corner. And if the Pope uh, d disagreed with something that rulers were doing, he had the power to either excommunicate or kick people out of the church, or even suspend the sacraments in whole regions of the church using something called interdict. These powers, and his power, of course, over your immortal soul, ensured that people would obey the Pope and that the Pope could be both a religious leader but also a major player in European politics. The Pope would also occasionally get involved militarily, calling crusades, which we'll talk about later. So the Pope, incredibly powerful and important, and the head of the Catholic Church. European society, socially and economically, was organized into a system called feudalism, which you might be familiar with. Feudalism is a system of relationships and responsibilities by which the people below generally look to the people above them for protection, whereas the people on the top of the system look down to the people below to provide for them. So for example, the king gives, gives land and uh, authority to the lords, and the lords in response, when the king needs soldiers to fight for him, will show up, put on their armor, and go fight. The knights provide protection and land for the peasants. The peasants work the land for the knights. And so this system of loyalty and responsibilities helped organize European life. The code of chivalry also helped organize European life. Take a moment and absorb the various values that we see in the code of chivalry. You can see some clear, uh, you can see some clear connections to Catholicism, but also the, the sort of a code of honor for warriors, and then generally uh, some basic laws by which to live. Knights were supposed to respect this code of chivalry, and this helped organize European society. At the very local level, each knight or lord would have his manor, which includes his large estate, some buildings that are necessary, your water wheels, your blacksmiths, things like that, and then the surrounding fields. As you can read here, this was the economic system of feudalism. The peasants worked the land provided to them by the Lord. The Lord provided protection for the peasants and also some resources, you know, water wheels, mills, things like this to grind up their, uh, to grind up their crops, and also blacksmiths to provide them with tools. 
Most peasants would then be bound to the land as serfs, and so as a, as a noble would inherit his new estate, he would inherit the buildings on it, of course, the natural resources, and also the people in order who would then work that land. The Middle Ages started to, started to fall apart or started to change in the late, you know, after the year 1000. The Pope and a variety of other nobles would, had called a series of crusades. As, as, the Islam, as the religion of Islam grew and took away territory from the Eastern Roman Emperor, occasionally Christians in Western Europe would launch these military expeditions to try to reestablish Christian control in what they saw as the Holy Land. Sometimes this was to aid the patriarch in Constantinople, but sometimes it was in order to raise the prestige of the pope or just for ru rulers who wanted to show their basic piety. These crusades were varying levels of successful. At the most successful, they recaptured Jerusalem for Christianity and set up a variety of Christian kingdoms in the Middle East. At their least successful, they only made it to the Christian city of Constantinople, which they sacked and then burned. So crusades, kind of a mixed bag. The Crusades had a variety of different important effects. One, all this traveling around, as we've talked about before, brought in new ideas, new beliefs, new technologies, things like that, moving from Asia through the Middle East and then back to Europe. And so we see stuff like luxury products reintroducing, uh, are reintroduced to Europe. We see new technologies. And then, of course, we get, uh, we get ideas like the Arabic system of numerals, chemistry, algebra, things like that. It also, to some degree, decreased the power of the Pope, especially the uh, embarrassingly failed Crusades where they ended up sacking Christian cities instead of retaking the Holy Land. And many knights and nobles spent so much money on these Crusades that they lost power. And this is one of the things that's going to lead to the rise of new monarchy and the centralization of state power within Europe, which we're going to talk about later. With the rise of the Mongol Empire, as we talked about in previous lessons, trade is going to significantly expand. And, and you're going to see new products and ideas come into Europe. These new products, in addition to broadening Europeans' horizons and introducing them to a whole bunch of different technologies and luxury goods from Asia, also brought significant wealth and trade to European cities like the quintessential port city of Venice. Venice became rich and powerful, and all of these new goods and ideas flowed back into Europe. All of this led to significant population growth. New technology and wealth led the population of Europe to grow, which led farmers to expand onto what we call marginal lands, which are lands that you probably shouldn't be farming if you have any other chance. They're generally rocky, they don't get a, or they don't get enough precipitation, or the soil quality is pretty poor. And so Europe starts to stretch its capacity to feed itself, which is really never a good idea because, as you can see, things are going to go down here in just about a minute. So the crisis of the 14th century leads to the total collapse of, of medieval society. First, you've got the Hundred Years War. It's ostensibly a war between France and England, and it doesn't, there's not a hundred years of consistent fighting, but what it does introduce, it, it does create a lot of death. It drains the treasuries of both sides. Joan of Arc gets to show up and like wave a flag and inspire the French people. But most importantly, it introduces the English longbow, which completely destroys the military order. With the English longbow, any peasant with a bow can kill a noble or a knight who's armored on horseback. And so rather than having to pay to outfit a whole bunch of knights and horses, which are super expensive, instead you get peasants with bows who then just can rain arrows down on them. And so now the military aristocracy starts to fall apart. The Black Death also shows up, and we'll talk about that later. There's a whole a number of years of brutal, uh, of brutal drought, followed by massive flooding, which wipes out a lot of those marginal farmlands and leads to a huge famine in Europe, which kills a lot of people. Then you've got the destruction of the legitimacy of the popes. The, 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 the great schism of the church, or the, the, the Avignon papacy, leads, uh, so a disagreement over who's going to be pope, leads to two popes, one in Rome, one in Avignon in France, both of them claiming to be the universal pope and the, uh, and the, the only representative of God. 
Then the church calls a council to attempt to, uh, to, to attempt to solve this problem and pick between the two popes. They end up choosing a third pope, and none of the three popes agree to step down. So this becomes really problematic because now you've got a whole bunch of people claiming to be God's divine representative and they disagree with each other about a whole host of different things. So what's the effect of this on Europe? Well, one, the Catholic Church loses a lot of faith and face because, I mean, they can't even figure out who the Pope is, which, you know, pretty embarrassing. This is coupled with something called conciliarism, where all of these popes, in order to get different people to recognize them, agree to give up the authority to appoint church officials and bishops. So, for example, the Pope in Rome then gives the King of France the authority to appoint French bishops, and so now the Pope no longer has the ability to choose who the church officials are going to be, which increases the power of kings and decreases the power of popes, weakening the sort of universal power of the Catholic Church. Then, in order to raise money, because of course all of these popes have lost significant portions of their estate, the, the church decides to more or less try to make money out of the appointment of church offices. They take huge bribes from wealthy families like the Medici, who we're going to feature prominently in our story here in the future, allowing them to choose and appoint their own family members into high church, of, into high church offices, and even sometimes picking the pope, which again, not ideal. The policy of simony, this uh, selling of church offices, becomes widespread. And so you get a whole bunch of high church officials who aren't particularly interested in like theology or running at the church and instead have bought their offices and now are trying to use them to make money. And so for the average person, these, these, these bishops uh, don't provide much religious guidance and instead just try to squeeze as much money out of the population as they can, which further erodes the faith in the church. And then you've got the Black Death. The bubonic plague has been around for a long time in various iterations. Uh, it crushed the Roman Empire a number of different times, including, uh, and the Byzantine Empire as well. This iteration came into uh, Europe through Italy, most likely from fleas on rats, and it was incredibly virulent and deadly. So you start getting these buboes showing up on your, some of your glands, then you have breathing constriction, seizures, and then within three days, you could go from healthy to completely dead. The bubonic plague wiped out whole cities and uh, led people to flee to, uh, to the countryside, leading to the further spread of the plague. And then during the pneumonic phase of the plague, it went airborne and stuff really fell apart. In the end, generally somewhere between a half, a quarter to maybe a half of the European population died of the bubonic plague, which, as you hopefully, as you hopefully know, will lead to societal collapse regardless of all of these other crises. So, those are the various things that led the Middle Ages to end and transitioned us into the phase that we call the Renaissance. So, hopefully you can answer these objective questions. Thank you for listening.